On behalf of the organizing committee, it is my distinct pleasure to welcome you to this, the uh, first workshop day of the inaugural Australian Mises Seminar meeting. I thoroughly enjoyed last night's dinner and uh, Professor Hopper's eloquent introduction into, um, and this will, into the ideas that he shared with us on private property ownership and the benefits thereof will provide us with great fuel to help drive and direct the discussions that will happen today. As was mentioned last night, let's network, let's share new ideas and interact so that we can make the most of this occasion and bring it forward into the future. With that in mind, it is my great pleasure to introduce today's opening speaker, rather, who is Mark Tier. He needs no introduction, certainly after last night. However, do indulge me as I provide, by way of some highlights, by way of introduction, um, that you can find on his website, marktier.com. He boasts several achievements in journalism over the span of his illustrious career. He is the founder of the investment newsletter, World Money Analyst, which he published and edited until 1991. He's the author of several books, including Understanding Inflation, a 1974 Australian bestseller, also The Nature of Market Cycles, and everybody's personal favorite, I'm sure, How to Get a Second Passport, which he published in 1984. He also served as Hong Kong correspondent for the New York Journal of, Com of Commerce in the late 70s, and he was also a columnist for the Australian Stock Exchange Journal and Business Traveler. He has also published articles in various themes in um, publications such as Reason Magazine, Time, and The Australian, and he's also spoken in seminars and featured in various events uh, around the world in places like America, London, Hong Kong, and Singapore. He also has a passion for mentorship and coaches investors who want to transform their investment results. Therefore, we are privileged to have a man of his standing with us here this morning. So therefore, please join me in welcoming Mark Tier. An ashtray. Anyone got an ashtray? <laughs> ah. Not in this house. I guess not. What I found here instead. <clears throat> hmm. Well, despite that no smoking sign, am I? Can you hear me? Okay. Just making sure this thing works. What would happen if I actually lit this? You think? Fire alarms yeah. go out. Fire alarms are cool. Fire alarms might, yes. How about your <laughs> <laughs> I better stand over here. Now. No, what would happen? Open the window and you'll be okay. <laughs> well, you don't see, you guys don't seem to mind, which is great. I'm sure, however, there's a slight other problem, however, on this issue, which you may be aware. <clears throat> Now let's see if this is going to work. Right, there is a law that says you may not smoke in here. And if I light up that, if I lit that up, there'll be a very expensive smoke, five hundred and fifty dollars maximum. Yeah. Now this is this is the law of the New South Wales government. What about if the proprietor of this establishment or of some restaurant, whatever establishment you like, is also a smoker? And he has no objection to smokers smoking in his establishment. Well, if he owns it, and I smoke in his establishment with his permission, it's going to cost him five and a half grand. And if he's just the manager, it's going to cost him 1,100 bucks. Right? And me, 550. Now, if you own a property, and please correct me if I'm wrong, don't you have the right to do with it whatever you want? Well, it's got Australia. 
No, I'm talking about the rights, not the law. Mm. On a question of ma on a matter of the, the philosophy of property rights, if you own this room, this restaurant, you have the right to say, you may all smoke in here, or you may not smoke in here, or you can dance naked on the tables, or whatever you like as the owner of this property, correct? Am I right? Right. <clears throat> Similarly, you have the right to exclude anyone you wish. You don't like blacks, we'll send this guy out. You don't like whites, send everyone else out. You know what I'm getting at? You have the right to admit or exclude anyone you like if it is your property on the basis of property rights theory. Now, obviously what has happened here? We have a law in this state that says the, pro the proprietor of a, any property defined as in here, in here as a, as a pub, you know, where, peop where people from the public are invited, not, not one's house. You can still smoke in your house at the moment. <coughs> and uh, does not have that right anymore. His property rights have been infringed. A part of that property right has been taken away. Now, here's a question for you. If you own a property and one part of, that, of your ownership of that property has been taken away, who owns the property now? Is it still your property? And okay, this is a minor thing compared to all sorts of other government invasions. But that's not the point. Let's think about the principle involved here. So tell me, <coughs> if, you, if, if you do not have the right to let people smoke in your property, do you own your property anymore? Well, let me put it differently. If you do not pay the rates, or property taxes as they're called in the US, what happens? Yeah, well, property's taken away. So <clears throat> when you have to pay tax to the government just for the right of having, a piece, having your property, do you own it? Conditionally. Certainly, sorry? Conditionally. Conditionally, not 100%, not, not absolutely. So every, now, is this important? Now I like to uh, um, I don't know if anyone remembers the Goon Show. I guess if you have to be <laughs> 50 plus to remember the Goon Show. <coughs> but Harry Seacombe it was a British radio comedy program, which is really great if you ever look it up on YouTube. Um, Harry Seacombe put it put the question of property rights or the, the why property rights are important very, uh, very succinctly. He said, everybody got to be somewhere. Everybody got to be somewhere. As Professor Hoppe was, was, was demonstrating last night, if you do not have the right to stand somewhere, you, you become a slave. Because then you can only exist by permission of somebody else. And this is why property rights are important, because <clears throat> a lot of people talk about human rights, but unless you have property rights, it's impossible to... Property rights are the, uh, the way human rights, the only way that human rights can be implemented, the recognition of property rights, because everybody got to be somewhere. <clears throat> it was interesting that... Um, I guess it was in the 60s that Ayn Rand uh, met with Hugh Hefner and um, persuaded him of this argument, at least briefly, <coughs> on the basis that she pointed out, now, if the government owns all the printing presses or if the Catholic Church has a monopoly of the printing press or the government merely requires you to have a license to buy newsprint or, or, or the glossy paper to print a magazine or book paper. 
Now, it does not need to impose censorship, quote unquote. It can simply deny you the use of a printing press by creating a monopoly <coughs> which excludes everyone else. Or it can deny you the paper with which to print, which is exactly what happened in the First World War and in the Civil War in the US and, and in many other places from time to time, aside from outright censorship. The point is, once you infringe a property right, then you infringe on that, that person's human rights, that person's ability to exercise his right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. <coughs> now, of course, the question of smoking appears to be, and for most people is, a minor issue uh, in terms of rights. I mean, the rights argument doesn't really come up because the rights argument doesn't really come up in anything, really, in, a, in the public debate. But let's consider how this came about. The, um, it's a health issue, right? Smoking, we are told, is bad for you. Who, but as a matter of interest, who agrees that smoking is bad for you? Please raise your hands. Okay, thank you. Who thinks smoking is good for you? One person, good for you. Two, who's agnostic? The rest of you. <laughs> now, here we have a, a, a possibly a random sample out of 100 people, two people think smoking is good for you, which is probably two people more than you'll find in the general public. The, um, I mean, it's quite obvious to everybody that smoking kills. We've heard this again and again, and it's, it's obvious. I mean, you smokers, <coughs> excuse me, they <coughs> cough, <coughs> right? They, they, uh, they run out of breath, et cetera, et cetera. It's obvious smoking is a bad for your health. So you don't need any research. The average person in the street doesn't need any research results, doesn't need any scientific evidence, doesn't need any proof scientific proof to know, quote unquote, that smoking is killed. <coughs> As a matter of interest, let me ask one further question on the health issue. Who thinks that sticking to the question of health, ignoring the other benefits a smoker might have, like getting high, on are there any actual concrete health benefits of smoking? Does anyone think there are? They may or may not outweigh the negative health benefits. I'm just saying is there at least one issue? So yeah, good, that's about five or six people. Now this is an actually an interesting issue because um, while most people think smoking kills, in fact smoking does have some positive benefits. For example, there have been many, many studies where animals have been injected with nicotine or, or they've had things attached to their throats to, so they smoke, you know, a dozen packets a day <coughs> in, an or, in an effort to induce lung cancer in these animals. Now, just on that particular subject, there was a case in, uh, where are we, the state of Minnesota, where did I go? when the state of, uh, sorry, the state of Minnesota sued the tobacco companies in 1998 for uh, recompense for the health costs incurred by smokers that they were forking out money for. <coughs> Experts for both the state and the tobacco companies agreed <coughs> that every animal study, every animal study failed to induce lung cancer in animals despite numerous attempts with countless animals and at various quantities and concentrations. Every animal study failed to induce lung cancer. <coughs> Yet, we are told by the smoke Nazis <coughs> that smokers have a higher incidence of lung cancer, etc., etc., than non-smokers. I don't want to really get into the health issue, but let me just give you one other example. <coughs> the, um, two, I'll give you two other examples. 
The <coughs> in, in one experiment, this was to do with radioactive, radioactive, the effect of radioactive particles. Every animal uh, they tested, that they exposed to radioactive part particles, died. 100% death rate. <coughs> now, by some mistake, 3,000 mice who'd been in this smoking experiment, you know, trying to induce lung cancer, got pushed into the radiation experiment. 60% of those mice who'd been smoking, exposed to smoke, lived. 60% lived. So, <coughs> if they start dropping bombs, you better start smoking. <laughs> <coughs> and also, uh, smokers have a lower, far lower incidence, the likelihood of getting Parkinson's and Alzheimer's disease. So there are some actual demonstrated health benefits of smoking and there are questionable uh, negatives because a lot of the research has failed to uh, produce uh, the results that the people hoped for. In fact, the first research done on this issue was by a guy called Richard Doll in London in the uh, 1950s. <coughs> His study is still, is still quoted today. It's the original one that, that you know, called, uh, shows supposed, supposed link between smoking and, and, and cancer. Um, however, in, let me see, here we are. it turned out that <coughs> Richard, it was later Sir Richard Doll, had a very lucrative career as a, re as a research, quote unquote, scientist for hire. His services were used by Dow Chemical, ICI, among other companies. He even made a submission to the, the Royal Commission in here in Australia, proving, <coughs> quote unquote, that Agent Orange was that did not cause cancer. <clears throat> In other words, he was, he was, uh, you say, well, I want this result, he do the research to support it. And, 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 nice treatment. <laughs> and in fact, in the December 2001 issue of the British Medical Journal, he wrote, and I quote, that the study, the smoking study, was devised to achieve the maximum publicity for the critical link between smoking and lung cancer. So, but you see, this doesn't matter. All this is irrelevant. Because it's obvious that smoking kills. Right? Everyone agrees that smoking kills. <clears throat> now, obviously, the tobacco companies opposed, they tried to oppose all these regulations, and they lost. And all the research they produced <coughs> was obviously biased because it was produced by the legal multinationals. This is the general public's attitude. So it was obviously biased. It was in their self-interest to produce results <coughs> that said there is no connection. I mean, it was obvious that smoking kills. So anything that supported that, you didn't need to question it. And of course, the majority of people are non-smokers. More than half of the people probably worn out. The um, and within smokers themselves, again, the arena of the, the realm of smokers. A lot of smokers want to quit for one reason or another. But it's very hard to quit smoking. So they're quite happy to be forced to quit smoking. So let's say, you know, most of the non-smokers, I mean, they don't care. If you, if you want to smoke, go outside. It's not my problem. <clears throat> and half the smokers say they're quite happy for no smoking laws to take into effect, come into effect. So a very small minority of smokers who would actively oppose them if there was any uh, likely chance of succeeding. So now, of course, we all go outside and have a smoke. Those of us who still smoke. And once I was at a seminar in a convention in New Orleans, and um, you know, I was outside and have a smoke. I had to look at the big convention and went all the way, and a whole lot of people out there have this one. And one of these guys had his badge, that put my badge on, um, which uh, said, Philip Morris. Ah, and I started talking to him. And I said to him, now, why, you know, you, you guys are being persecuted by you know, the government, etc., etc., for, um, 
because you produce a product that's supposedly causing cancer. Maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. That's really not the point. <coughs> Why don't you stand up instead of, you know, you, you've been arguing with these, these guys about the health issue. They're presenting all this evidence that smoking is bad for you, and you're standing up saying, no, it's not. I mean, that's a losing argument. You let these guys set the terms of the dead debate. You're never going to win that argument. Why don't you stand up and say, everyone under the American Constitution has the right to go to hell in their own way. If they want to smoke, it's their decision. It's got nothing to do with you. You, the government, do not have the right to steal or to tell people what to do. Oh, no, no, no. We, we can never do anything like that. So the only issue that possibly could have, could have won that debate was you know, won on the question of rights. Of course, probably just as well they didn't because it would have smeared the whole rights issue with the usual multinationals and so on. But anyway, the point is that they, they, they argued on losing terms and lost. But in, in the end of the day, they actually agreed that they didn't really mind too much. Why? <coughs> because it raises the barrier to entry, right? There, there is very little competition now in, in the supply of tobacco. <clears throat> because who's, who can afford the, uh, you know, the costs of, of possible legal costs, et cetera, et cetera, of going into that business? So you've got two or three major companies in the US producing uh, cigarettes, et cetera, and they're very happy to be taxed. They're very happy to be restricted. They're very happy to have labels. I mean, they complain, but they're very happy because their oligopoly, if you like, is protected against uh, dirty competition, which is just as well. Now, in the Philippines, for example, you can buy a packet of cigarettes. What does it cost? Cigarettes cost what, $16 a packet here? Something like that? In the Philippines, you can buy that same packet of cigarettes including Philippine tax for 50 cents. So, you know, most of the price of a packet of cigarettes is taxed. Okay, now, <coughs> so I mean, what, what is likely to happen if property rights are respected? And we still have the same situation. I mean, there are a lot of non-smokers who think, smoking kills and don't want to be in the same room with smokers. So there is a market demand for non-smoking restaurants. Similarly, there is a market demand <coughs> for restaurants where you can smoke. Well, let's take another example, McDonald's. Quick example first. McDonald's, uh, I don't know how many years ago, changed the packaging of their Big Macs, if you don't remember that. They used to come in styrofoam boxes. They now come in cardboard boxes. Why did they change? They changed because there was a campaign in the US <coughs> from the green movement about these, you know, un these unrecyclable styrofoam uh, boxes, that, the packaging that McDonald's was using. And <coughs> there was a threat of a boycott and, and uh, McDonald's getting a bad name because it's not green enough, etc. Cetera, et cetera. So they switched their packaging. Because of market pressure from people who believe this particular issue. There's no government regulation at that time, and maybe now. So in other words, the market can uh, you know the market expresses people's opinions as well as their demands through their through their pockets. So now, in um, recently in the Philippines, it's the next one of them. Recently in the Philippines, where I've been living for the last few years, <coughs> Starbucks, which is um, very successful in the Philippines, uh, a locally local, it's a locally owned franchise from the U.S. company, so it's a Philippine company paying franchise, <coughs> and the the owners are a bunch of greens. So. Out of the blue, they announced that all their restaurants, nationwide, were going to be no smoking from whatever date, April or something. 
So this was intriguing. I predicted they'd lose 20% of their business. Gross. Uh, now this is, this was taken as I recall, 3.30 on a Sunday afternoon after the no smoking policy had come into effect. Now, you can see on a great picture, you can see here the Starbucks logo. Okay, inside there, that's, that's uh, air conditioning area, which, you know, by law is no smoking. Here, these outside tables, uh, tables where smokers congregate, you know, the humidity, the flies and mosquitoes, while well, no smokers were in air And you can see there's one person, or two. 3.30 on a Sunday afternoon at this particular location, you could not find an empty table before the smoking ban. There was no empty table. There might be empty seats, but no empty table. Here's another one. Nope, wrong button. Am I supposed to point this? Oh, press a different button, right? There's another one, 7 o'clock on a Sunday afternoon. Yeah, Sunday evening. Same thing. This is the smoking area here. Well, there are a couple of people here. No one else. That's the same thing. 7 o'clock on a Sunday evening. You could not find a table there. <coughs> so this, this, went, this lunacy went on for five weeks. Now, being a private company, they, they never produced, you know, we don't know their financial results. But you could see that they were hurting. They were losing a lot of business. And one, one of the stores I went into, <coughs> the lady told me, she put it this way, she said, what we used to sell on Monday, I did one day, Monday, now takes Monday to Thursday. In other words, that store had lost 75% of its gross income. Now, <clears throat> now the problem, the Starbucks management had a problem, obviously. They were going to lose, they were, they were already talking about, they already cut store hours, they were laying, they were reducing no overtime, of course, reducing hours, etc., etc., talking about firing people. And um, they had a big problem. So there were two ways to go about it. Now, don't forget, this, this was Starbucks Philippines' own decision. It had nothing to do with the law. You could go anywhere else to where there were outdoor tables and smoke. And that's, of course, where smokers went. But not only did smokers go to other places, other coffee shops, other restaurants, their no-smoking friends, some of them, some of their no-smoking friends, a lot of their no-smoking friends went with them. Hence, empty stores. Now, <coughs> So the Starbucks management had a problem. They really had two choices. The first choice was, of course, to back off, restore the smoking tables, get their customers back. Of course, not all their customers were going to come back because they found that some of them would have found that they really prefer the coffee or the or the, or the pies or whatever at you know, another place. So that was, that was a stupid decision to begin with. The um, other option they had was to persuade the government to ban smoking in all restaurants. Now this would have failed for the simple reason at that particular moment, I'm not saying it would fail now, but at that particular moment it would have failed because all the other restaurants who were benefiting from Starbucks stupidity would have opposed that move. Right. Now, I don't know whether they even considered that as an option, but in any case, you after five weeks, they restored the, the came, you know, their sanity came back. So, this is that the same, uh, same place taken from the other side. This is after the smoking tables have retired. Now, you see these ones are empty. Because when they put the smoking tables back, they kept the ones near the door of the store it was kept the non-smoking tables, but it's still empty. Now here's that other place. Now this is an interesting one, what happened here. Because 
when they institute, when they put the smoke containers back, oh, this is, this is, sorry, uh, this is before when the no smoking ban was in effect. This is after, this is about one o'clock on a Sunday, last Sunday actually. Um, it's usually, you know, later on it will be fuller than that. But what happened? When they put the smoke containers back, that was the smoking area. These were still non smoking tables. Because this is the Philippines. A bit like Italy, but with fewer, fewer observers of the rules. <laughs> well, I'll give you an example. There are, I mean, driving in Manila is the closest thing I ever expect to get to anarchy in my lifetime. <laughs> Perhaps um, like Cairo, maybe Istanbul, I'm not sure. I haven't been there to uh, Istanbul. But <coughs> a friend of mine there told me there are traffic rules. The rule number one is whoever is in front is right. <coughs> rule number two is if you see an empty space, occupy it. <coughs> rule number three is traffic lights are only advisory. <laughs> and um, so these are rules, they, they are real rules. Nobody wrote them down, but if you observe the behavior of the drivers, that's the rules they follow. And of course the traffic lights are only advisory, they follow them, uh, that rule, when there's no policeman inside. Anyway, <laughs> so smokers, <laughs> when they came back here, started ignoring these no smoking. So what the management did was expanded the, no smoke, the smoking area until the full smoking area was restored. <laughs> the entrance of the door in this case is over around the corner. So that other door wasn't there, other door wasn't fly. Now, <clears throat> this is a reverse market option. Uh, the point is the market will determine through the demands of the customers whether there are smoking areas or no smoking areas, whether <coughs> um, you know, blacks will be served or not served. Now, there is, for example, you look at uh, segregation in the South of America and apartheid. The reason, they, one reason they had rules that blacks were not permitted in these restaurants is because there were some restaurant owners, and they could have even been included like Klux members, for we know, who were happy to serve blacks because they paid. They made money. It was profitable to serve the, 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 the persecuted races. And you can see if there have been no uh, laws against desegregation, against segregation. There were no desegregation laws, no laws outlawing blacks or coloreds or whatever other people, you know, non-whites from using this. Then very slowly the market would have eroded those restrictions while maintaining the right, of course, for the property owner to exclude anyone he wants. Um, so the same sort of thing happened here. The market spoke and the management listened because the alternative was to go out of business. And when the market speaks and is allowed to speak, then property rights and human rights are safeguarded. Because when the government comes in and uh, begins to do things like it did with smoking, it uses it, 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 it. The only way it can, the government can achieve what it wants is by taking away some of your rights. And inevitably, that means taking away some of your property rights. Because that's how human rights are exercised. There is no other way. But the government doesn't come in. I mean, that's, this is why the smoking example is a perfect, this is a very good example. The government doesn't. I mean, there was a time when everybody smoked. There was not a problem. A few nut, nutters who still smoke was bad for you, um, and you smoked anywhere you liked. And there were no no smoking places except perhaps in the intensive care wards of hospitals. Um, now they didn't change that overnight. Now, they didn't say wake up. You didn't wake up one morning and find that okay now smoking is banned in all restaurants. You've got to go outside. You've got to do this. You've got to do that. No, they didn't do that. They first started requiring no smoking areas in restaurants. Now, if you could 
smoke over there, but not here. Then they required perhaps a walled off area, ventilated and so on. There was, it was salami tactics, slice by slice, and slice by slice. <coughs> and it keeps, they keep adding small things, little tiny steps, like little steps. Like in Queensland now, it's a, you're not allowed to smoke outside. I mean, where food is served. It's crazy. Sunshine state. Now, if um, I've often thought about setting up something that smokers' rights, like all, uh, which would have called for a Japanese boycott in Queensland, the Japanese smoke, and the Chinese for that matter. Anyway, never got around to that. <coughs> so, the difference between now and then, if, you're, if you've, anyone's read 1984, you'll remember that uh, Big Brother is watching you, right? That's from a, I think, a poster for the movie. But George Orwell was wrong right in one respect. The big brother is watching you a bit too in your face. You know, he's not a friendly sort of character, right? Today we have big sister is looking after you. <laughs> and when big sister looks after you in the cradle to grave welfare state, the only way she can do that, of course, is by putting one hand in your pocket and the other hand up your ass or whatever. In other words, the third one taking stuff away from you because she's got a finance. Plus, of course, all those people in the middle are going to have their share. Thank you very much.